Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our mission conference. Thank you for joining us online. Let's stand. 341. 341. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came to the Lord. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood. to sing a special song this morning we sing during our missions conference it's called going forth to conquer and it's to the tune of standing on the promises going forth to conquer in the master's name marching forth together with our hearts aflame going forth to conquer in the master's name marching forth together with our hearts aflame telling in the byways that the savior came doing what the savior said to do going telling doing what the master said to do together doing telling we're doing what the savior said to do Jesus said to teach him of him every place. Jesus said to tell the lost of saving grace. Soon we'll stand to give account before his face. Have we done what Jesus said to do? Going, telling, doing what the master said to do together. said to do many hearts are hungry for the bread of life many more are battered by the 
sin and strife. We must go where misery and sin are rife. We must do what Jesus said to do. Going, telling, doing what the Master said to do. said to do go telling doing everything we can showing those in darkness God's redemption plan telling how he loves the souls of fallen man doing what the Savior said to do going telling doing what the master said to do together be seated out in the auditorium. Our choir's coming, right? Yes. The choir's coming to sing. But going, telling, doing what the Master said to do together, doing, telling, we're doing what the Savior said to do. We need to go out and give the gospel to every creature. Go out across this world and let people know, and that's why we have this mission conference to emphasize the missionaries that are willing to sacrifice and go across the world and preach the gospel.
Well, wasn't that a great song? That's a wonderful, wonderful song. Thank you so much for coming to church today. It's the start of our missions conference. We love missionaries. We love missions conferences. And we love to be here in the preaching of God's Word. And Brother Freeman will be preaching to us today and always does an excellent, excellent job. We're grateful for Lou, his wife, being here as well. And we're close to about the same age. I'm younger, though, correct? I'm younger, and I look No, I, oh. <laughs> I was getting ready to say it. I even look better, but he, he beat me to it. Got people egging you on. That's great. We like to have a good time in church, and I'm so appreciative that you're here today. At this time, we're going to have our missionaries that will be that are here this week for us, uh, Jeremiah and Abby Unruh, uh, missionaries on deputation, getting to the field of Sri Lanka. And I did not realize we met last night for dinner, but his father, his mom and dad, have been on the mission field for years, so he's a missions kid, and they are in Sri Lanka. And so Sri Lanka's been much in the news. A lot of things are going on, so interested to hear what they have to say. <clears throat> and so on Monday evening, uh, tomorrow night at 6.30, we'll be here in the auditorium and be on the right side, and it'll be a question and answer time. So if you have questions you'd like to ask them, you're not under fire, this is not rapid fire, uh, but it's a time that our people can kind of get to know you and you explain uh, the mission field and so on. So that'd be from 6.30 to 7. And then uh, Monday night, they'll also give a presentation for about 20 minutes of Sri Lanka and uh, talk about the field and so on. So make sure you come each night. And then the mocks will be on Tuesday night. We'll repeat the same thing at 6.30. Then at 7 o'clock will be the service. And they'll have about a 20-minute uh, slot there to talk about uh, the fields, the, the homes that they represent around the world. They've been with us for many, many years. Uh, my son stayed in their house. They still count us as friends. That's amazing. That is really amazing. Didn't even ask him for a security deposit down or anything, but I don't think he tore anything up. But they had some interesting times, I'm sure, with Chris in college. And they house uh, Bible college students down there in the Knoxville area from Crown Bible College. And they've done that for many, many years. So always good to have Ted and Joe with us. And Rocky, love Rocky. He'll be coming to present some things today. And then uh, th today, this morning, and tonight, and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night for the children, uh, during the time we have services downstairs, Joe will be giving a children's church with the different things that she does with Ben Twelve. I can't even say that, so I won't even try to say that. Uh, but she does a great job. So we planned that this year so you can bring your kids. Sometimes it's hard to bring your kids if they're in here and you, it's hard to listen. So we provided something for them. And it's excellent, excellent stuff. So make sure that your kids come. Bring some friends. If they got friends, they'd like to come and have them come. And so that would be a great, great time. So right now we're just going to introduce the missionaries, have them come. So Jeremiah and Abby are going to come. And they have uh, two uh, young boys, William and Walker. And so I don't think they'll be speaking yet, but uh, interesting, all right. And I, it's hard for me to remember those days. That was a long time ago, but it's great to see young couple and with kids and all kinds serving God. And they're sending churches, Southwest Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. Brother Jason Gaddis is the pastor, and we know Brother Gaddis for many years when we went to camp. And when he was coming to camp out of Bowling Green, Kentucky, and also go way, way back. So a great church down in Oklahoma City. We asked them to come and give a few minutes of testimony, introduce themselves, and each one of them is going to speak here this morning. So go ahead. Good to have you here. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Pastor Thorne, for this opportunity. We're excited about the missions conference this week, and as Pastor mentioned, I was uh, raised in the country of Sri Lanka. My parents have, have been there for 30 years now, and uh, even Brother and Mrs. Freeman got the went over there a couple times, and it was good to get to know them last night a little bit, but um, I was saved at the age of four and realized that I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior, and then when I was 12, um, surrendered to full-time ministry at a missions conference in the Philippines, and I didn't really know what the Lord had for me at that point. I just wanted to be, be surrendered, and so I went through my teen years and uh, just kind of struggled a little bit with some of my own desires, I, I wanted to play sports or be a mechanic, and it felt like God was just clearly saying, you need to go to Bible college, and so I uh, surrendered to that finally at the age of 18, and arrived in Oklahoma City when I was 18, and it was like, it was like culture shock in a lot of ways, you know, um, a couple of things, uh, to Pastor and I were talking about it a little, little last night, I forgot to mention, I found myself driving on the wrong side of the road a couple times, and and stuff like that but on top of that you know as a college guy just 
trying to do your own laundry and, you know, different stuff like that. But really what God used that time in my life is to change my perspective on Sri Lanka. And up, to, up until that point, I had viewed Sri Lanka as my, as my home place. And it was familiar. That was where all my friends were. I didn't really view it as a mission field because I saw people lost in their heathenism. And it didn't really affect me the way that it needed to. And so God shifted from my perspective and said, no, Sri Lanka is a mission field. And specifically burdened my heart for that part of the world that we call the 1040 window. And started praying about it. And then that, that summer I met this lovely young lady here. And uh, she started talking about how she grew up eating rice and curry. So I said, well, this has to be the Lord's will. <laughs> and uh, so we, get, we got married a, a year and a half later. And um, did a two-year missions internship at Southwest Baptist Church, and then have been on the road of deputation for a year now. So we're excited about it and excited about this missions conference. I'll let my wife share a brief part of her testimony. Okay, so I'm thankful for a dad and mom um, that love the Lord, and we did family Bible studies, and it was during a family Bible study um, at the age of four that I realized I wasn't saved and I needed Jesus as my Savior. So I prayed that night to receive Christ as my Savior. And of course, I had a lot of growing to do. Um, and in my teens, I remember reading the book of the life of Mary Slessor. She was a missionary to Africa. And as I finished her book, God just was really burdening my heart. And I just told him, I said, Lord, I want my life to look like this for you, serving you and giving the gospel. I had a big problem though. I just did not like meeting new people. I didn't like talking to strangers. And so I was like, how's this going to even work? Um, and I was like, God, I'm going to really need your help. I remember my parents telling me, don't look at your toes when somebody's talking to you. You need to look at them in the face. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have to really work on this. So I was able to just work with like different Bible clubs and um, after school Bible club programs in Oklahoma City area and I learned to give a Bible lesson I learned how to share the gospel and I remember sharing the gospel with a young boy who's the first boy that prayed to receive Christ after I shared the gospel with him and I just remember the joy that just came to my heart and said God you can you can help me share the gospel with others um, and so just later on, I met Jeremiah, but I was able to take a recent trip to China, and I really knew God wanted me to do missions. I just didn't know where. And um, I met him, and just we just talked about our hearts for missions, and yes, a year, a year and a half later, we got married. And um, yes, God has just been working in our hearts about the mission field of Sri Lanka, and we're very excited about it. Isn't that exciting that God's still calling young couples out to serve him? I could identify with several things in that testimony. Washing clothes in Bible college as a young guy. And uh, the different colors that they came out when you threw everything in the machine at the same time. Comical, but you, you laugh. At, a lot of guys don't know how to do that. And boy, that was, that was an interesting time. And then I can identify with Abby about a shyness. And I, I really... I've said it many times in our church, I had to take speech class and couldn't pronounce certain things, and I really wasn't comfortable standing in front of people. But God took that away when he called me into ministry. And God can use anybody. And I'm so grateful for those testimonies that God just uses ordinary people. And he puts in them the ability to do un beyond the ordinary and take those things that they have fears and difficulties, and God can remove that. So never feel that you can't do something for God. We can all do something for the Lord. What a wonderful testimony. Thank you so much for sharing that today. And then Ted and Joe Mock, if you come and give us a word of testimony, then Joe's going to do Rocky a little bit here this morning as well. And I know that's really why you came today is to see Rocky. You know, Brother Freeman, don't get too excited that they're here for you. They're really here for Rocky, okay? So I learned to swallow that pride pill a long time ago, right? So we appreciate so much the Mocks. Been friends for, with them for many, many years. I represent the children's homes all around the world. Used to have one here in Mississippi, and, and I think that one's closed up at this time. We've supported the children's home and supported them for many, many years. So great couple, love the Lord, doing a wonderful work in that area, and appreciate so much when they can be with us. Yeah. Well, I know Rocky's going to take up most of the time. Most of you people know us. I'm going to tell you, to, you know, who's it? Yeah, uh, it's just good being back. 
And uh, I don't know what I did to offend Pastor last time, but it's been a long time since he's asked me back. And um, the place has changed. It looks good. And seeing friends is good. And i got to say, thank you so much for your prayer support, for your financial support. If it weren't for churches like this, I don't know what we would have done when COVID threw all our scheduling out the window. God has been good to us, so good to us. Some of y'all communicate with us every once in a while. And I want to say this, on our display table, there's some little cards. If you want to fill it out, and if you can write it where I can read it, I will email you my newsletter. And I will not charge you because it's free. <laughs> uh, Chris did live in my basement and made a point of telling us that he was not going to give back his key because that's his home. And uh, Bob Mann stayed in my basement, your brother-in-law. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. <laughs> and uh, Chris was a picky eater, and Bob was an eater. <laughs> and they felt like my refrigerator was their refrigerator. And so it was interesting um, to think that I have been in churches, some of those boys that have stayed in my basement, and they're now pastoring or they're out in the ministry. It's just a great thing seeing other folks that I know from college days. It's wonderful what God is doing. Now, this is all I'm going to say before we turn it over to Joe and Rocky. And brother, you don't know, but this is dangerous. <laughs> I found out last night that dear brother Freeman lived in the dorm floor underneath me in Bible college. He's just a few months older than I am. And uh, we know and associated with every uh, nefarious riffraff person that ever went to Bible college. And uh, so afterwards, this is the deal. If you'll pay me $5, I, I will tell you some interesting stories. And, uh, and so that's the deal. Or I'll take 20 bucks from you and not say anything to anybody. <laughs> Choice is yours. Choice is yours. So. <laughs> oh, yes, but Rocky gets the turn first. So just. Wow. It's so good to see everybody again. I'm missing some people that aren't here. Amen. I just heard last weekend and my heart was just broken. I just don't even know what to say about Dean not being with us. We know where he is, and that's the blessing, that's the blessing, and I just want to say to this young couple, hearing their testimonies was such a blessing to me, and Abby, I feel your pain right now, I'm shaking like a leaf up here, <laughs> even amongst friends, you know, you never get fully over having to stand in front of people, and I always felt that way too, but as a child, being trusting the Lord as my Savior and always wanting to serve Him, never faithfully like I should, always, but always there's that, that deep desire, and I just want to, one of my favorite scriptures now is, but as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, what a responsibility, what a privilege, and I just thank you for being our friends, still being our friends, <laughs> and loving on us, and we just love y'all so much, and so now... I'm going to get Rocky out and we'll have a little fun, hopefully. I know. You never know what he's going to be saying. I don't know where to stand so everybody can see, but um, kind of up front here, close, right here, what do you think? Okay, we'll do the best we can. That's what we're doing in this life right now, hanging in there like a hare in a biscuit, doing the best we can with what we got. <laughs> That's my motto. Okay. Here we are. My goodness gracious. Let me give myself a little bit of room. i got to scoot out just a little bit. Well, Rocky, here we are. Let me just look back and back out. Rocky, I, now look, I can't understand you. Well, I'm trying to tell you. I just, I, 
Rocky, I know that we've had a lot of things going on the last two or three years and appreciate you're trying to take care of, you know, yourself and everybody else, but I can't understand you. Well, I'm just trying to touch it. Rocky, look, we're just going to have to take that mask off. No, no, I just can't do it. Rocky, I can't understand you. People can't understand you. No, no, I'm going to get sick, I tell you. Rocky, it's fine. You're up here. Everybody's out there. You're social distancing. It's not as bad as it used to be. You don't have to worry as much. Are, are you okay? No, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm worried. Well, I didn't realize that, that you were so scared about, you know, getting getting the virus. I'm not scared about that. Well, what are you wearing this mask for? Because I'm here at Capital City and I don't want to get the pastor's cooties. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Rocky, pastor does not have cooties. Oh, yes, he does. Get my mask back on. No, he does not have cooties. Pastor Sticker has got cooties, I tell you. It's Pastor Thorne, not Pastor Sticker. I don't care. He's still got the cooties. I need my mask back on. He does not have the cooties. His own wife's not wearing a mask over there. Yeah, she gave me her mask. She said she wanted to protect me. Look, stop it right now. He has not got the cooties. Look at him. He looks fine. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> of course, he looks just fine. He's not sick. Look at that face. I know. I don't want to, but I had to. Oh, I'm serious. Look at that kind face he's got there. Yeah, he does have a kind face. All right, now you should be feeling better. I just don't know what kind it is, and I'm scared. <laughs> Will you stop it right now? He's fine. He's not sick at all. He's okay. Yeah, but he might have that kimono virus, <laughs> the coronavirus. He doesn't have the coronavirus. He's doing fine. And there's a, something a lot worse than the coronavirus. Yeah, his cooties, I tell you. No, <laughs> you get over that right now. I'm trying to tell you, there's something a whole lot worse than than the coronavirus. What is it? Well, it's something we're all infected with. Oh my goodness, put my mask back on right now. Now, I'm just trying to say it doesn't have anything to do with being sick physically. It's sick spiritually. Huh? Every one of us, we, we're all born with sin and that's the worst thing that anybody could have. And there's no known cure in the earth, but only the cure of Jesus Christ. And what are you saying? Well, I'm saying the only way that we can go to heaven is by trusting Christ as our Savior. He's the one that, that gave us his blood, shed his blood so that we could go to heaven. Are you going to go to heaven? Well, yes, I am going to go to heaven. How come you get to go? Well, I get to go because I was nine years old. And I trusted Jesus as my Savior, washed away my sins. Yeah, well, you've got a lot of sins, all right. Hey, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all needed a Savior. I trusted him at nine years old, and now I'm on my way to heaven. Well, how long are you going to be gone? Well, I'm going to be gone forever and forever. Well, Lee, are you all tacked up? No, when I go to heaven, I don't have to take anything with me. You said you're going to be gone forever. I am going to be gone forever. Woo, we are you going to start stinking after a while? No deodorant, no clean clothes. Rocky, when we get to heaven, we don't have to take stuff like that. How come? Because we're all going to have a brand new glorified body. Well, did you hear that? Treat your sticker, you're going to get a new body. <laughs> Rocky, we're all going to get a new body. No more arthritis, no more bursitis, no more tendonitis, no more gingivitis. Rocky, we're all going to have a grand, glorified body, and I just can't wait to get there already. Yeah, me too. Well, you know, I'm not sure about that. Huh? Well, you know, you're just, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, what? Well, you know, you're just, I'm not sure if it's possible. What are you saying? Well, it's just that I, I don't know. What? I just don't know if dummies can go to heaven. <laughs> Rocky, get back up here. Stop doing that. Well, if he gets to go, I ought to get to go too. <laughs> Rocky, I'm trying to say you're just made out of, of wood. Well, he's just made out of dust, and it's kind of dusty right now. Now, stop that right now. You're just full of stuffing. Well, he's just full of hot air. All right, that's it. Stop right now. We'll have to talk to the Lord about that. I thought, I thought you would be so excited about being here and seeing all our friends, and now you just start right in on the pastor immediately when you get here. 
Well, he's just got that face that cries out for it. You know what I mean? Now look, aren't you happy to see all our friends and, and Miss Renee and Pastor? I'm so excited to see all my friends and Miss Renee. It's great. And Pastor. And Miss Renee, she's the best thing ever. Isn't she great? I tell you, we love Miss Renee. And, and I want you to be nice to the pastor. I love Miss Renee. She's just the great thing. Rocky, I want you to give the pastor a little respect. I'm going to give him as little as I can. <laughs> You're already doing that right now. I want you to be kind to him. He's been pastoring here, I heard, for like 37 years. Is that right? I'll send y'all a sympathy card next week. <laughs> you don't need a sympathy card. He's been doing a great job. God has really been using him. Yeah, he looks all used up, I'll say that. Rocky, I can't believe you said that. Yeah, well, you had a hand in it. Don't forget that. <laughs> all right, all right, Rocky, all right. I want, it's about time to go. I want you to say something nice to the pastor. I'm drawing the blank here. Rocky, I said, say something nice to the pastor. Oh, yeah, well, uh, he does look like a million dollars today. You've never even seen a million dollars. I know, he looks like something I ain't never seen. All right, that's it. You're out of here. What did I say? I didn't even get to say hi to the girls too late. You're out of this. Get back in your trunk right now. Oh, man, this is ridiculous. Hey, girls, I just want to put the lid on him, right? Thank you all. I don't know who made out the schedule that made me come up here after that. <laughs> Rocky, I'm not. But I have to say, I, I commend our pastor for his incredible courage to sit on the front row knowing that Rocky was coming out of that box. <laughs> I think he was hoping that, that Ted or Brother Freeman would be deflecting some of that, but it didn't happen. That, that was brutal. Yesterday, I went to our family reunion, and man, we had a great time, saw some, some faces we hadn't seen in, in several years, and then to come today, and it's like a step above that. It's, it's a family reunion, people we haven't seen, and then talking about Dean, I keep thinking there's another family reunion coming, that if, if you're having a good time today, it's going to be so much better, so much that we can't even imagine. There's a great family reunion coming. Today, as we take up our tithes and offerings, let's look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, we'll start reading in verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If the ushers would come forward, the word compassion, it doesn't just mean caring or having some sympathy for someone. Compassion means you have the ability to help and you do it. That's what compassion is. And John says, if you have the ability to help and you shut off that valve, is the love of God in you? So we're here this week, we're hearing from God's missionaries going out to spread the gospel. And we're going to hear that they have some needs. Do you have the ability to meet those needs? Do we have that ability? And then also, does the love of God dwell in us? Let's look at John chapter 3 and answer that question. We'll take up our offerings and then we'll recognize our guests right after that. Brother Bill, would you lead us in prayer for our tithes and offerings?
We'd like to recognize you. If you're here with us for the very first time on a Sunday morning, could we see your hand to acknowledge you, please? All right, we're all returnees. Thank you for coming back to Capital City Baptist Church. God bless you for the missions conference. Here we come. Amen. Uh, right now, all the kids are welcome to go downstairs into the classroom where the mocks will be this morning. And so let's go ahead and stand 233, the theme of our mission conference this year, For God So Loved the World. We'll sing this two times through. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary's tree from sin to set me free someday he's coming back what a glory that will be wonderful is love to me for god so loved the world he gave his only son remain standing well my heart's been blessed already I always want to stand in honor of God's man and the Word of God this morning so brother Freeman you come preach to us what a privilege it is to have you and your wife with us and you've just enjoyed the times over the years that we've been able to do that and we thank you for coming and doing a great job there it lives I think in Taiwan goes into China so it's a real mission field there today and so we appreciate the fact that there are churches there. He's established a lot of churches over the years. God's used him in a remarkable way. He, he comes from the state of Michigan, and God has sent him all around the world and has done a great and wonderful job and very, very productive missionary. So we're honored uh, for him that, to be in our pulpit again today. Brother Freeman, will you come and preach to us today? God bless you, sir. used to have the use of both hands, but need one to stand nowadays. <laughs> I want to read you just a verse of scripture from Acts chapter 7. If you want to follow along, Acts chapter 7, verse 9, down to verse 14. Acts 7, 9 to 14. It says, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over, all, over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and, and Canaan and a great affliction. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this church and for all the folks here. And we thank you, Lord, for the history of it and all the churches, Lord, that have preached the word throughout these centuries. And we thank you, God, now that we're seeing the, uh, the times come where we can see the power of God on ready display every day of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you sent these things this way to open our eyes to see how great and how mighty our God is. Now bless these folks that are here today. Open their hearts, open their eyes, open their ears, that they might hear from the Spirit of God through His Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. In the scripture we just read, it takes us back into the Old Testament. And this passage in Acts chapter 7 is in the beginning portion of the book of Acts and when the Lord was transitioning from his, his ascension and getting into the church age in the way that we know it, where churches are started, he comes to Acts chapter 7 and in chapter 7, uh, Stephen's talking here and he gives a testimony. And the testimony that is historically used for churches to be started was back to Abraham. 
And so if you start in Acts chapter 7 and read it, you'll find that he talks about Abraham and how God called Abraham to a different place, away from his homeland and put him in the land of Canaan. And it says many times in the Bible, a land in wherein he was a stranger. And so he brought him to a new place to establish him in the faith and to withdraw him from the uh, things that had surrounded him in, in Ur of the Chaldees there. And he separates Abraham. But in this passage, instead of going to Isaac and telling you something about Isaac, instead of going to Jacob and telling you a lot about Jacob, Stephen goes immediately to Joseph. And Joseph, of course, is where the book of Genesis ends. And so he takes us back from Abraham to Joseph. Now, we often say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But actually, the fourth one would be Joseph, all right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And in the Word of God, Joseph is known greatly as a type of Christ. And so therefore, uh, in the New Testament then, when Paul the Apostle speaks of Abraham, he mentions this because Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ all the way back in the book of Genesis. And what I'm going to do this week is spend some time here with you. And there's two reasons. One, because these sermons are the last ones that I preached in Chinese, and so it's the only ones I've got, okay? <laughs> uh, that's on the service, all right? And the other is, I did pray about this, okay? So I, I, I got that going for me, all right? Uh, but uh, Joseph, uh, Paul the Apostle said this of you in the New Testament, ye are the body of Christ. That's what he said. Now, he didn't say, when you obey God, you're the body of Christ, because that isn't true. You're the body of Christ, no matter what you do, once you're saved. You are the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. And that's why in our churches, and we preach, of course, we emphasize the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We have a testimony to bear. And in the Old Testament, that type is found in a man named Joseph. Now, Joseph, depending on what book you read, uh, when I was in BBC, you know, there were 104 things in his life, Don Davis, that he was like Christ. And then I heard another sermon, and this guy had 131 things, you know, and, and somebody else had 50. They t talk about Joseph as a type of Jesus Christ. But in a better sense, he's more a type of a Christian because he's human. Because there are things in his life that he does that aren't right, okay? But he depicts in his life Jesus Christ. And people, uh, you know, as, we, as you see Joseph's life this week, you'll see uh, he was tempted for vengeance on his brothers, right? I mean, let's face it. When they came down and he knew them and they didn't know him, he said, you're spies. <laughs> what every younger brother wants to say to his big brother, right? You're a loser, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, But in that sense, then, he's just like you. And I want to just show you this week, as we go into this mission conference, how that God picked Joseph the fourth uh, in that line of patriarchs to do what it is that he told you and I to do here. God, through Joseph, began to fulfill the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it was different than what they wanted. Joseph was the first man in the Bible that God says he would gather to him all the earth. Every country on the earth will know Jehovah God in the Old Testament because of Joseph, not because of Abraham. Abraham was first, but it was his children, you see, that came by faith that preached to the world. Now, Galatians 3.14 says this, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles by faith. That's you. What was the blessing of Abraham? It wasn't property rights. Now, the Jewish people today and their mentality, see, is property rights. But you and I know that that wasn't the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham was that he was given the righteousness of God in heaven. You're a Christian. You know what the Bible says about you? You have the righteousness of God given to you. How about that? You say, but I'm a wicked sinner and I mess up and I blow it all the time. That may be true. But when you pray, you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you because of your faith in Christ. And because of that, we then, like Joseph, have the world coming to us. Now, as we begin then, I just say this to you. We live in times where 
Satan, of course, uh, uses all the same tactics that he used all the way back in the book of Genesis. He wants people to fear. He wants people to look at the outward, all right? He wants them to think that all is lost, and he wants Christians to think that too. He wants Christians to think that the thing that will save their country is to vote in the right person. Now, I vote, and I, I voted for Reagan, <laughs> okay? And uh, I've, I believe in all that stuff, but listen to me. As a child of God, you are more than an American. And you've got to really see this in Scripture. God raised you up above your country. Your country is totally dependent on your faith in your God. Without it, there is no country. Without God, there's no reason for the United States to exist. No nation needs to exist without God. And so that's why in Scripture we can go all the way back to Genesis, as, as we will this week, and see how God did what he did in their lives is what he'll do in your lives so that you can do what he wants and reach the world for God. And when they come, you'll know what to say. Now, Genesis 37, if you will. And the pastor said, you need to get out by 4.30 this afternoon or I'm going to stay right on that time, okay? All right. <laughs> you know, you need to thank God we don't preach on the jet lag. You know, if I had to, but, but never mind. All right. It's a killer, okay? Genesis chapter 37, all right? And it says here, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Verse 1, okay? And so, as we said, a stranger, all right? God made him a stranger. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad with the sons of Billah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was of the, the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father favored, uh, excuse me, loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and they hated him yet the more and told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now most of us in Sunday school at some time in the past, you know, we've uh, heard the story of Joseph seeing the flannel graph, the coat of many colors, all right? And uh, we know this story well. And, but when the Lord shows up here, he's actually painting a picture for us so that we'll know this. The key when you read the Old Testament is this. It's prophecy, all right? So to understand the future, you know the past. If you know the past, you'll know what's going to happen out in the future. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of that, and that's what he tells you in the New Testament, right? Know your history, where you're from, and you'll know what this is all about. And so the Bible opens here then with Joseph, a type of Christ in the Old Testament. Of course, when he's living, there are many things that are different. There's no churches. There's no Bible. None of that's there. In fact, the only thing available in the Old Testament in, from Abraham on that we know was a sign of worshiping God was an altar. So that meant meeting with God in prayer and talking to God was primary. It had changed in the scripture from Genesis up till Abraham, you see, until the flood came. We know very little about that time except we know one thing. We know that the Garden of Eden and the gate to that garden was on earth. And we know that God's presence was there. And so men, if they wanted to, could find out what God wanted. But they didn't. They walked away. So God's presence there and all this change and Abraham comes along. And the Lord does what? The Lord calls to him. Now, 
the last time he did that was in a garden of Eden where he called to Adam, right? And he said, where art thou? So he calls to Abraham, and Abraham then comes into the land, and you know the story of his life. He comes into the land. He brings his nephew, his father. They come part way, and his father passes away. He comes into the land, and there's all kinds of trouble, all right? It doesn't just go smoothly, but he comes in, and he does the one thing that gets passed on to his great-grandson here, as we'll see. He believes what God says, and that is the key. Now, in this time then, Joseph comes and it says he dreamed these dreams. So here's what's going on. He's got these older brothers. And Joseph was born in a foreign land. He was born back in the land where his great-great-grandfather had come from, where Jacob went there to get a wife. And he not only got one wife, he got two. Bargain days, I guess, you know. And then he wound up with four because they were so bad. So if you've been married several times, don't worry about it. These guys, they had the same mess in their life back then, okay? All right? They had wives all over the place. And uh, you, you know the things that go on in my family. And as the, there's a divorce, remarries, all these things happen. And sometimes you forget who's who and where they are, you know? And it was like that. So Joseph grew up in this. What he had seen of his father was carnal. Now, he had probably heard Jacob tell the story of the ladder and the dream. He might have heard that, see. He probably heard tell of Abraham. He never really saw Isaac, his grandfather, because he was born out of the land. And when he came back to the land, the Bible says J Jacob and uh, Esau buried him. It doesn't say anything about their children being there. So probably he never got to know his grandfather Isaac. But he knew the faith. He knew the reason they lived in Canaan. So he'd heard that, but what he saw in his family was anything but thriving in the land of Canaan, the blessings of God. He saw his father always lying about things so that his brother Esau would leave him alone. So Joke Joseph is growing up here, and things began to fall apart, 16, 17 years old. He comes to that age. You heard the missionary testimonies, you know. A lot of us, when we're children, we come to Christ. When we're a little older, we surrender to the Lord, maybe a, uh, between 9 and 12 in there. But many times, it's when we're teenagers, in our late teens, that we actually come to grips with we have to decide between God and what He wants and life and what it offers us. And that's the decision you make, all right? When you're younger, a little bit younger, it's not so hard because we're choosing God. We don't have many options. But when you get in your late teens, you'll have a lot of options. So God in Joseph's life is going to put these choices out like he does you in your church, all right? It's God or outside, the way people think, all right? God of the world. That's always the choice. And Joseph comes in, and he wants to get connected then to his brothers. Because in this stage of the game, Jacob has become an apathetic father. Now, he dreamed the dream, but probably because he stole the birthright. And probably because he had underhandedly deceived his brother, his conscience bothered him so bad that he just couldn't quite stand up to Esau and say, the land is mine. With the title lead in his hand, he couldn't move into his own apartment. How about that? And you see, sin will do that to you. The truth of the matter is this. Jacob never did need to steal the birthright. His father Isaac was told and mother was told the, the elder will serve the younger. That's God's pattern, okay? And that's God's pattern because the first Adam failed and the second won't. He wants that pattern throughout the scripture and he always gets it. So Jacob comes in and he's not authoritative to take the land. So the land, if you read the scripture, you find out that Esau put dukes all over the land. Now what was a duke? A duke was like a self-appointed governor of a certain area. So Esau controlled the land. And Jacob's got his boys, and they're down on this farm down there in, in the southern part of the land. And there's still Phyllis, there's still all these people around, and nothing's going on. That's where Joseph grew up, looking at that, a dead place. When you read of Joseph here, there's no altars. When you read of Joseph here, his father never says to him one time, son, Serve God. Love God. Pray to God. He'll help you with your brothers. None of that. He just loves him because he's like a grandfather, gives him a coat of many colors, and he makes the mistake 
that a whole generation of people have made in our country. He thinks that he can raise a child with gifts. You cannot do it. Your children don't want gifts. They want you. They want to know what makes you tick, right? And so the, the things that they've gone, and so Joseph's that way. So he comes to the Lord, and the Bible says, tries to get in with his brethren. So how's he going to get in? Well, he squeals on them. Don't you hate little brothers? My little brother be here tonight. Same mess, you know. <laughs> you know, it gets you in trouble for what you did do, and then gets you in trouble for what you didn't do. Okay, and uh, what was it that Joseph wanted? He wanted what all young men want. He wanted his older siblings to take him and make him part of them, because they're heroic to him, not his daddy. So he's looking at this, and he can't seem to get in. Now, why? Well, because all these boys know that Leah, their mother, the first, they know that her, their mother was not the one that Jacob loved. He was a Rachel man till the day he died, wasn't he? And when he died and finally got right with God, the Bible says he told his boys, he said, uh, uh, when, when you bury me, don't bury me with Rachel. You bury me with Leah. Because Leah was the pick that God sent to me for the line. That's where Aaron came out of, see? That's where Moses came out of. That's what God wanted. Rachel's what he wanted. She was the jet set, nice looking boy, everything about her he loved, right? And you see, all of this Joseph knew. Now this brings us this simple sermon then. So what was it that Joseph was given a choice of that you get a choice right here at the beginning of this conference and in your life? What was it? Joseph, in, at night, when he was all alone, was given by God a choice to seek the favor of God above all else. So he's given a dream, and it comes in two parts. And Joseph knows when he comes... At the time of this dream in his life, of course, it's peril in the family. It's not going good. Spiritual collapse has taken place. And he is the weakest. He's the youngest of the boys that can work. His little brother is way too young to work, but he's the youngest on the young end. And at a time like that, God comes and says to Joseph, Joseph, I can fix this, but you have to choose the favor of God above the favor of men in your life. Because right now where you are, you want your brothers to accept you. You want your father and all your family to raise you up and love you. But Joseph, I want you to pick me. I want you to love me more than them. And Jesus said it well, right? He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. We think that a hard command. But you see, when you choose the favor of God, it changes everything in your life. When you choose God above all else, above the world, everything is different. When you've got the favor of God on your life, you can do things no one else can do. You can pray for things no one else can pray for. You can witness th of, of the truth that no one else has because you have God in your life. You chose him, see. And Joseph's dream comes at that time. It doesn't come at a time when he's abounding in spiritual things all around. It doesn't come at a time when the nation of Israel said, Oh, we blessed you and Abraham and the face passed on. It doesn't come then. It comes all of a sudden, quietly in the night, and God says, Son, you want me or you want them? I can help you with it all, and I will bless you with it all, but you have to yield to me. And at the beginning of your conference, it's the same, right? You are the body of Christ. You're the body of Christ. And if you want God's favor, he'll give it to you. But you can't be like every other church in the United States and all over the world. You can't envy all that they've got and want all that they've got and have the favor of God. It doesn't work that way. And you see, Joseph comes then and says his brother's Tells him the dream. And of course, on the fleshly side, the first thing his brothers say is what? That's a strange passage, isn't it? Are you going to reign over us? He had never said anything about reigning over him. 
He just said, my sheep stood up and yours bowed down, okay? Well, that's enough, right? When you're 17 years old, tell them that. But look what happened at the next dream. The next dream, and this is the contents of these dreams, see? The next dream, he told to his father. Now, the reason you know that Jacob right here is very backslidden is because of what he says. Jacob is a man whose whole life has centered on a dream. His whole life in the land of Canaan is centered around three dreams that he had. One with a ladder reached into heaven. One in the land where he got his wife about how to raise the cattle and become prosperous. Remember that? And the other one, when he got in the land, he dreamed again and wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Remember that? And he was limping. He, had a, he didn't have a cane, but he needed one, all right? And he limped, all right? And the Bible says, he heard this dream and rebuked his son. How sad. The man who should have known how God was dealing in his family. They weren't a nation. Of, they didn't have books. So they knew that when God spoke, he spoke to people in visions, in dreams. That's how he did it, all right? And some people say, well, he doesn't do that anymore today. Well, he sure, he, he does it in the same way. He just doesn't do it like the Hollywood way. There's nobody in here that hasn't ever been praying and you had the Lord really speak to you, right? Haven't you been in the church service and, and the preacher's preaching and he, he might be hollering about something way over here and he says a verse and it just bam right into you and, and you get a vision of your life and what you can do. That's the Lord and that's what he did. So he gives him two visions. One for the earth. And that one is brother's envy. The second one is about heaven. And his father rebuked him for that. What a sad state. But in that time, what God was doing then is saying to Joseph, I am going to take you and save your family. I can do it. Trust me. So his dream content comes and he realizes this. Everything he will do in the flesh, all of it, if heaven is not behind it, it means nothing. And it's like in our church here this week, if all the money you could give, if you gave millions of dollars, it would mean nothing without Jesus Christ behind it. It has no meaning at all. Our government spends billions of dollars on food and stuff all around the world. How come it doesn't change anything in the world? Because God is not behind it. And churches go out, and I can, you can hear these testimonies and all over the place where God sent someone over there with smaller amounts of money, and lives were changed. And preachers have gone out. Uh, Lou led a lady to Christ uh, when we, the second, third year, I think she was an alcoholic, couldn't read. And she learned to read in our Bible Institute just enough for a few verses and learned to give flannel graph, okay, and, and uh, Ing, Ing May. And uh, went in the ministry, her husband and her, and we just got word last week. Uh, from her Sunday school all these years, there's eight teen missionaries in foreign countries from Taiwan from a little mountain area that she led to Christ and brought in how come because if God's behind it it's got meaning and you see in your life what you've got to get straight is this if if you put God out and it's all about the flesh you will have a meaningless life like the brothers of Joseph. It'll mean nothing. It'll just be covetousness all over the place. But if you choose the favor of God in your life, you may have trouble, you may have all kinds of things happen like he did, but God will make it meaningful. God will give you the courage to do it. And then, moving on. Oh, there is a clock here. And it's flashing. Is that bomb under here or something? <laughs> Boy, you worry. <laughs> when Pastor Sticky puts it up here, you know. <laughs> now, third then, what was the purpose? The time was in a time of trouble, in a time of great peril is when the Lord spoke. The content was that heaven has a purpose on earth. Do that purpose, you'll find God's blessing. But what was the the purpose now behind his dreams was this. The Bible tells us, as we see the story of Joseph, that God's purpose, first of all, was to fulfill his word. Now, where was his word? His word had been spoken 
to the great grandfather of Joseph. And he said, to thee and thy seed after thee, I will give this land. So the first thing God was going to do is keep his promise. But he needed a person to whom he could talk so he could keep this promise. So he chooses Joseph, you see, out of that group. And Joseph then begins to have a purpose in his life. And that's why we say this. When you choose as a young person or an old person or a middle-aged person or a whatever kind of person you are, I can't, I don't know your pronouns, you know. But when you choose the favor of God, what that does in your life is this. It gives you direction. Now, direction is important because God does it in a different way. When God deals with you, you have what we call a dream for your life. Now, what's the dream? The difference in a dream and an illusion. A dream is a long way off. It's a destination. So, God, you get saved. Now, what's, what does God give you? You talk about it all the time, right? Heaven and how it's going to be. And we j make jokes about it. We laugh about it. We shout about it. We sing about it. And when you get into church to start talking about heaven, I don't care how sick you were last week, you feel good. You know why? Because you're entering into the dream that God puts in the heart. The salvation brings forth. And it's a, we haven't seen it yet. But we know it's real. And we're going there, right? We're going to heaven. So it gives you direction because God puts it there. When you're young and you get called to the mission field, you, you don't know what the road's going to be like. But in your mind, you're thinking, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go there and I'm going to pray. And it's a long way off. Now, what's an illusion? What an illusion is always for your gratification immediately. So it's like this. An illusion would be that I'm going to go be the quarterback for the Indiana Colts today. Indianapolis Colts, is they still called that? I mean, I, you, got, you guys have messed the names up. We don't know what to call you, <laughs> okay? Thank God it says you're the body of Christ. Otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> but if I said that, what is that? Well, that's for me and myself and what I want, and that's called an illusion. Illusions vanish quickly. Dreams do not. That's why in your life, that's why as a young person, you have to get the distinction in those things and choose God's favor. If you choose God's favor, it will sustain you through all the events that follow. The purpose then was to fulfill God's word and fulfill his promise. The Bible says, as we said, that the blessing of Abraham might come on them. All right. That's a New Testament verse about the church. The blessing of Abraham coming on you, all right? And that's why this stuff happened. Then the Bible says that the actions of the God in our life always involve other people, and that's the purpose. Lives cross. Now, Brother Mark was talking, you know, we laugh at some of them, you know. And we laugh at all the stuff. But you know the real side of that? I was thinking about last night. I don't know where all those people are, but you, you remember... We used to lead people to Christ in the shopping mall, okay? And very often, you know, I mean, we were young and eager. We had, you know, we didn't know. And our response to everything was, uh, well, I don't know, but you're going to go to hell, <laughs> you know? And probably we led a lot of people to Christ because we were too stupid to do anything else, right? We just didn't know the Bible. We were out there, and God blessed, all right? Lives cross. Joseph's, the purpose of his life, and all that he's about to go through with his family, and all that he's going to go through in the separation, and all that you'll see this week that he went through, all of it had one purpose. God said, I'm going to save the world, and when I do, I will save your family. And that's how it happened. And in our modern day, when we look at the Jewish people, you know what God has done? You know how Countless thousands of Jewish people are, got, have been saved. How come? Because you folks called Gentiles believed. God brought you, you received Christ, and you sent missionaries back to God's chosen people. How about that? We got two missionaries from Taiwan in Israel, one in Bethlehem, and one uh, up the road in Jerusalem, all right? From Taiwan, Chinese Gentiles preaching the gospel with 10 or 15 Jewish people that have received Christ. 
How can that be? That's God's way. The purpose of God in your life is somebody else. It's somebody else. Now, why does God do that? Because he knows as a sinner, as a sinner, that's the only thing that will keep you from dying in a pool of self-pity. He knows that about you. He made you that way. He made Adam and said he needs a helpmate. He's got a spot in his heart where if it's just him, he's going to sit down and say, well, it's just, I don't know. Nobody loves me. And, you know, I go to McDonald's, you know, I said, I don't want cheese. And they gave me two extra cheese, you know. And then I, I went through the drive through you know, and I wanted a Coke. and didn't have any fizz in the Coke, you know. And then I drove my car, you know, and I had a flat tire while I was fixing it. And somebody broke the windshield out. You have a day like that? And my mother used to say to me, you know, she used to say, get a grip, that's life. <laughs> uh, it's not in any book, you know, but that'll work, you know, get a grip, you know. <laughs> and my dad said to me one time, I fixed my flat tire, and, he, and I was mumbling, he goes, he, goes, he said, hey, don't worry about a flat tire, it's going to get a lot worse. <laughs> oh, boy, the house never been told, amen, when you get older, you know. But you see, listen, God has a purpose in you reaching somebody else now what does it do for you well, I'll tell you what it does you can be in the worst place of your life really down and somebody come up or somebody shows up and says thank you for leading me to Christ now I've had that happen some of these older brothers have had that happen I'm gonna tell you something it doesn't get any better I see things and we see things as missionaries and in the ministry of God that Donald Trump has never seen. I mean, literally. I was at Hong Kong starting a church, and I think I might have told this before, but that's okay. I need to hear it myself, okay? I sat out there, I sat there on a Sunday, you know, in this church. It was, and Brother Matt's back there, he knows. Now, Cantonese language. Now, that is the only language that I'm sure came right out of hell. I mean, you can't, that language, man, it's got, it's got so many different tones, you know. You say to them, you know, I'm going, and they say, no, and you say, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but here I am at a Cantonese church, and I got to preach in Mandarin because they speak Mandarin and English because the other half can speak English, okay? So I'm translating for myself. And any of you that speak a foreign language, you know, you have to be pretty much out of your mind to try that, you know, because you can't remember. But anyway, this church, people were being saved. And we preached at the, it's called, the, uh, what's that building? Dot <sighs> Hintah, what is it? Uh, anyway, it's the place where all the illegal immigrants meet. It's, it's like Texas to you folks, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, every, if you're from Texas, it's, it, never mind. It's, you know, but Hong Kong's got one. They, have just, they just built a big old building and signs point that way. If you're illegal, break it, just go into there. And anyway, Chung King Mansion. And I'd go down there and preach and, and uh, bring him in. So we had a guy come, and he was Jewish. Well, I didn't know he was Jewish when I first started talking to him. He was in there begging, and uh, he got saved. He came to church. I baptized him. And he's a Jewish guy, you know. And turned out he was a medical doctor. His life had fallen apart, and there he's sitting. One day in the office of that church, I was sitting there, and a Muslim came in. And he came in, and he had these Chinese papers he needed me to fill out for him because he couldn't read Chinese. He would try. And so he slammed them down, you know. But if you ever deal with Muslim men, you know, even, I mean, you know, they're all... They're, they're out of their mind most of the time, you know. Well, they don't know what to, how to be polite and things. And so you don't expect that from them. They're lost, right? Un, listen, unsaved people always act unsaved. You remember that, you'll get along better. So he just slammed it down, and I didn't even look up. And he said, you have to fill these out for me. And I said, I just looked at him, I said, I said, don't you mean please, American missionary, fill them out for me? And, you know, oh, there's one God, Allah. I said, well, evidently, Allah's not doing too good today because he needs a Christian Baptist missionary to fill out the form. <laughs> you know, you, you can have fun. Don't worry about it, you know. And uh, make a long story short, he starts coming. He said, well, what do I have to do? I said, well, be here on Sunday, and I'll fill out the form. So I filled out the form, and he came. So I'm sitting here. 
this, their platform little, you know. I'm sitting here, and I'm looking right out here in the center. And right in front of the pulpit is this Muslim guy. Sitting next to him is a Jewish guy. Sitting next to him is a Korean businessman. Now, the businessman has 18 offices in the city of Hong Kong, multimillionaire. The Jewish guy is a beggar from the Chungking mansion who his, his testimony was he found two half sandwiches in a, in a garbage can and was able to share with his friend. He said, you can't find two good sandwiches in, in Hong Kong garbage anymore, you know. People eat them all. They're selfish, you know. So he's sitting there by a Muslim, okay. Now I'm sitting up here and I'm thinking, I'm an American. My dad is from Pigott, Arkansas, the rural area of Pigott, Arkansas. You know, I mean, no one knows where he's born. And here I sit in Hong Kong. I'm preaching a Mandarin service. This Jewish guy is talking to a Korean guy, and they're teaching a Muslim guy how to look up the verses in a King James Bible <laughs> in a Cantonese church. Did you know Donald Trump's never seen that kind of stuff? Never. That Muslim guy, you know what happened that day? He got saved. I baptized a Muslim in a Chinese church, and a converted Jewish guy prayed before he got baptized. You say, how does that happen? When you choose the favor of God, and God is in it, that's what goes on. And in your life, and this week as you see this life of this man, Joseph, remember this. As God picked him out as weak, so he'll pick you. He didn't feel qualified. He was running to his dad. He didn't feel strong enough to make it. He wanted his dad to help him out. And God said, Joseph, you need more than your dad. You need what your dad won't ever supply. You need me. And this week in a mission conference, let's remember that. You're the body of Christ. Now, what was it Joseph had that his brothers didn't have? In Genesis, very quickly, if you go to, when you go to chapter 38, that's one of those chapters that's for private reading. There are many chapters in the Bible we don't read publicly, all right, because of the contents. But what that's there to show you is this. It shows you very clearly why God picked Joseph and not Judah. Joseph was a man who believed God and the Spirit of God in 37. In 38, it shows you that Judah was a man of the flesh who God would have to deal with in order to put Israel in the land. And he did, but Judah wasn't ready. Joseph was. And God picked him, all right? In the New Testament, there's places where the family was dependent. The Philippian jailer, remember that? God sent Paul to a jailer, and his whole family was dependent on what he believed. Now you're here today. Some of you have unsaved loved ones, unsaved friends, unsaved family, unsaved children. Don't know what the situation is, but I can tell you this. In the Word of God, God picked you out because you're the key to their life. They don't even know it. They don't even appreciate it. They will curse your day and make life hard on you. But you are the key to their salvation. And you need to be the one that says, God, I don't know how my brothers are going to react here. And they're awful mad. But I'm going to do what Joseph did. The one thing he did that they wouldn't do. You know what it was? He believed. That was it. His daddy didn't believe. His brothers didn't believe. But Joseph believed. And his whole life, as we'll see after this, is all centered around one thing. He believed that when God spoke, that was true. He believed God would do what he said he would do. Would you bow your heads? What a powerful message. As we get ready to do the invitation this morning, 
more than anything else as a Christian, we need the favor of God. I think so many times we make decisions based on what we need and what we want and not the favor of God. Let's sing, I don't know what youth paper, let's sing I Surrender All. So in just a moment as we stand, and what a great way to start a missions conference in a way that you probably, if you've been to mission conference, think, I've never heard anything like that. But the whole thing about missions as well as everything else is, do we want the favor of God? So today, if God's spoken to your heart, God has placed you here and God has saved you if you're saved for your family and for your friends and the people that you come across to make a difference in their life. How could God save the Muslim and the Jewish man and, and the other individual because the favor of God was on the servant of God as he preached the word of God, brought conviction to those people and their lives changed. In our country, we're trying to change everything with dollars, money, and we need the favor of God. We need to win people to Christ. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this powerful message, God. I want the favor of God on my life. And God, I appreciate the fact you saved me. But you didn't save me to sit. You saved me to serve. You saved me to give me people that would be around me that I could witness to and talk to about the Lord. And that's what this world needs. Our theme song is about the love of God and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son God people need the Lord and church people need the Lord may we be at this conference to be eager to hear what you have from your word in the life of Joseph to be a man or a woman who has the favor of God in our lives Father speak to us as only you can God how you've spoken to my heart today thank you so much for your servant that you've sent this way to preach the message to us. God, speak to hearts as only you can. And may decisions be made today that will last a lifetime in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're able to stand today, would you stand? As we sing this song, I Surrender All. If you're here today and you've never been saved, then you need to come. And I like what he said, saved people ought to act like they're saved people. I like that. So if you don't know Christ today, may you come to this altar and let someone take the Bible, show you what you must do to be saved. If you want the favor of God on your life, may you come and say, God, help me to know the favor of God in my life. And not to make decisions that we all make sometimes impulsively and in our flesh because of what we want, and we won't wait on what God wants. The message is very, very clear today. God or the world. That's how simple it really is. As we sing today, if you need to make a decision in your life, would you please come as we begin to sing? All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender To Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now, I surrender.
you may be seated. And what a great way to start. Man, I'm glad I came to church today. And that's the way it ought to be when you come to church, that God gets a hold of you through his word. Ushers, let's come. We're going to take a love offering. We take love offerings during the missions conference. And this is how they make a living as well. To, as they travel around, this helps them to supplement their income. So I trust you'll be generous. And, and God's always blessed us in missions conference. And we've done it initially years ago. I say this story many times because we had to. We didn't have any money. <laughs> And, uh, but then God got us to a place where we were able to have some money, but God never changed my heart. And God spoke to me to not set amounts on meetings. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not critical of churches that do. But God said, I want your church to have the privilege if God lays something special on their heart that people can give generously and the money goes to the missionaries. We don't keep any of the money for the missions conference. All of that's divided up uh, to the missionaries. And so that's, God did that for me many years ago. And I never always wanted you to have the privilege. It's called a love offering. Because if God lays on your heart to be very, very generous, it goes to them. And God has blessed that over the many, many years. So I trust you'll be generous. Most of us here in America have more than we'll ever need. And we can certainly give back. Brother Clay talked about that. Be generous in your giving this week. And let God work in your heart as only God can. Our Heavenly Father today, thank you so much for your word. God, my heart is full today. I needed a missions conference because I need to have the favor of God in my life. And Lord, I pray that we will not take for granted these meetings. That God, you put on our heart some time ago, the speakers, to contact them, and that's all in your divine plan of what you would have for this church. So God, I pray that we would take advantage of the meetings, that we would be in our place as much as we possibly can tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, because you have from your servant what you need this church to hear. And God, I pray we would take advantage of this great opportunity to be in this missions conference. Thank you, Lord, for how you will supply and even abundantly supply. In Jesus' name I pray.